Now, whenever human rights are raised, China will say two things. One, they'll say it's an internal matter. And two, they'll say, who is America with its racial inequality problems to lecture China or anyone else about human rights abuses? On the former, I write in my book, quote, determining the rate of a capital gains tax is an internal affair. Debating the best route for a new high-speed rail line is an internal matter. The torture of Zumaret de Wood, a Uyghur, is a matter of the whole world. This summer, the Chinese Communist Party celebrated its 100th anniversary. Amid the patriotic festivities, President Xi Jinping delivered a pretty harsh message to adversaries, warning that anyone who dares to try to bully, oppress, or subjugate China will have their heads bashed. Okay, maybe not head bashing, but in recent years, many scholars have noted rising aggression from China, particularly under President Xi Jinping. And at the same time, the relationship between China and the United States has become increasingly fraught. Is an aggressive China really a problem? What do we do about it, about China's human rights violations, its broken international agreements, its increasing military assertiveness? Confront? Cooperate? convince, or something else. Sam Kaplan is the author of Challenging China, Smart Strategies for Dealing with China in the Xi Jinping Era. And he's with us tonight to discuss these very questions. Sam Kaplan is the director of the Center of Excellence for Global Trade and Supply Chain Management, which connects industry and education in Washington state around workforce development issues. The center maintains data on industry, including numbers of jobs, where they're located, and the average wage. It organizes a follow the supply chain study abroad program and has worked with colleges around Washington state on global trade and logistics curricula. Sam also publishes the weekly newsletter, International Need to Know, and is president of Gitis Global. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, a business consulting firm which provides business development, communications, and community government affairs services for businesses and organizations. Sam, thank you for joining us tonight and welcome to World Boston. Thanks very much for having me. It's great to be here. I'm going to try and share my screen here now. Um, it's always great to be connected to Boston. Uh, my nieces went to Northeastern University, or one of my nieces went to Northeastern University, and the other one is uh, a urban planner in Boston. So hopefully all your urban planning is going better since she started the last two years. Um, yeah, and I thanks for being part of, it's great to be part of the chat and chatter. I have my Northwest style chatter here. Um, I don't have Boston style chatter, I apologize, but great to have some Northwestern chatter. I'm uh, here to talk about one of the four most important issues in the world, what to do about a more authoritarian, more expansionist China. I do go into fun loving detail about this in my book with Challenging China, which is available at Porter Square Books or anywhere you can buy books, though probably you can't get it at a bookstore in China or Hong Kong. If you want to know what the other three most important issues in the world are, you're going to have to wait for my next book. I'm about 15,000 words into it. So as Mary said, I've been working with China for a long time in one way or another. Uh, way back in ancient times, I worked in Washington, D.C. doing foreign affairs and trade issues for a congressman. Uh, and then I've also worked in business and trade and now in higher education. Like many people working with and dealing with China, I became more and more concerned in the 2013s. Which brings me to the great escalator incident of 2015. I was part of the host committees that organized the visits of Xi Jinping in 2015 to Seattle and President Hu Jintao in 2006. And the differences in the two visits reflected the changes that were taking place in China. When Xi came, there was a large gala dinner at a hotel in downtown Seattle, and I helped organize it. And in that hotel, there's a set of escalators, and Chinese security demanded that we turn them off for the entire duration of Xi's stay. But that would have been against the fire code and against the law. And so we told him, no, we, we weren't going to do that. And we had plenty of measures to keep President Xi and all the other dignitaries safe. Well, in the afternoon before the dinner, but during some Xi meet, meetings, I happened to be walking by the escalators and they were turned off. And nearby, I saw the, the US Secret Service person we were working with. And he came up to me and said, yeah, the Chinese security went over and physically turned off the escalators. 
uh, and he decided it wasn't worth fighting them on and he was going to let them turn off for, for a while. So China was much more assertive, willing to buck law, common sense, and the US Secret Service. In 2006, during Hu's visit, early on, Hu's advanced teams actually asked our local host committee for suggestions on what to do and when to do it. They, they even asked how could they avoid rush hours so they wouldn't inconvenience our local community. And Hu's advanced teams, they were empowered from early on to make decisions. With Xi in 2015, they told us what to do, did things when they wanted. In fact, they went during rush hour and caused a huge traffic jam, which upset a lot of uh, people in Seattle. And no decisions were made until Xi's inner circle came about a week before the trip. China was quickly becoming a different place. It's become more oppressive and more expansionist, and that's a bad combination for the world. Now, right after Xi became president, during a tour of South China, he gave a public speech that a lot of people interpreted favorably. And in fact, some people started thinking, oh, he's going to be a reformer. This is great. But during that same tour, he gave a secret speech to party members where he talked about the lessons the party needed to learn from the fall of the Soviet Union and that the Communist Party of China needed to take all measures to make sure the same thing didn't happen there. So that, that speech made clear that rather than reform, there was going to be just the opposite. And over the next seven years, she gave a lot of speeches. And if you read them carefully, and if you do, you might want to have a bottle of wine handy because some of them are three hours long and they're all full of complicated Communist Party jargon. But if you read these speeches, she made clear that China aims to supplant the liberal world order and make this world safe for authoritarianism. Uh, as Mary talked about, human rights have deteriorated measurably over the last decade, most famously in Xinjiang and the western part of China, where the Xi government is committing what some people are calling genocide. And in fact, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has called it exactly that. You know, China has swept up more than one million Uyghurs, an ethnic Muslim minority group, into concentration camps, and they been, have been forcibly re-educated. And you know, eight, nine months ago came credible reports that the government is forcibly sterilizing Uyghur women so they can't have children. And a few months ago came reports of systematic rape of Uyghur women prisoners. And China's efforts are succeeding. Between 2017 and 2019, the birth rate in Xinjiang fell in half. So China's actions in Xinjiang are one of the great human rights abuses of the, of the 21st century. But it's not the only human rights abuse China is committing, which has become more oppressive since Xi took over in 2013. When Xi became president, he instituted, instituted a corruption crackdown, and it swept up some 2 million officials of both high rank and low. It began shortly after he took office, but it's been expansive and ongoing, including this, this last month where they've now investigating a former justice minister. Among the high brought low are seven at the Politburo and cabinet level, but the campaigns have swept up a huge number of people at the national, provincial, and local uh, leadership levels. The writer Richard McGregor has called it a generational cleanout. And actually, there was a lot of corruption that needed to be clean, cleaned out in China, but the campaign has also served a second purpose of solidifying Xi's grip on power. And in addition, more than 200 lawyers in China involved in human rights issues were questioned and detained after Xi became president. And then in 2015, in what became known as the 709 crackdown, so 709 is named for the date it began on July 9th, there's a crackdown on human rights lawyers and human rights activists all across the country, with hundreds of these people arrested, and many are still in jail or detained. And China has become more censorious of the internet, the internet is increasingly restricted in China. Just today, we heard about the LinkedIn, uh, Microsoft LinkedIn, Microsoft headquartered here where I live, uh, is going to be leaving China because of those problems. And in just the last month, we've seen China crack down on celebrity culture, video game usage, and so-called, quote, sissy men. And a few weeks ago, China banned a Japanese anime movie. It had no political message to it, but it was banned from a streaming service nonetheless. You know, I'm probably not going to be able to cover everything here in this presentation because just in the last month, maybe a decade of things have happened. Uh, so feel free to ask me anything I don't cover during the presentation during the question and answer period. So China is more authoritarian than it was, but it's also become more expansionist. And I, I don't mean just geographically in terms of trying to take over land, though they are doing a bit of that as well. 
Here, for example, is a map of the South China Sea where China is claiming large swaths of territory. The blue line shows economic zones that countries can have based on rulings by the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. The red dotted lines, that give, that's China's unilaterally based zones, it has no basis in international law at all. To give a little perspective, China is claiming territorial waters more than 1,000 miles from their borders. That's a little bit like Portland, Portland, Oregon, not Portland, Maine for you folks on the East Coast. It's like Portland, Oregon claiming Chicago as part of its city, that Oregon invented deep dish pizza. But China's expansionism is really more than geographic. They're attempting to change the post-World War II, post-Cold War liberal world order into one that they can control. They're trying to make the world safe for authoritarianism. One example of this is the United Nations International Telecommunications Union, the ITU. It's kind of a boring sounding organization, you know, it's not an exciting sounding thing. But China is actively using this organization to propagate facial recognition technology standards onto the world. The ITU has responsibility for creating standards for global telecommunications technology. And China is changing these standards to make it easier to use government surveillance technology to spy on citizens. And China is also exporting to and helping developing country governments use this technology to repress their own citizens. So the UN International Telecommunic Telecommunications Union, I can't even say it, it sounds boring, but it's actually uh, something we need to be paying attention to. China has also become more vocal about Taiwan and about invading it. It's been flying fighter jets into Taiwan's air defense zone, including dozens of times in the last couple of weeks. China has been more vocal about military plans to invade Taiwan. And the People's Daily earlier this year, the People's Daily, the main government-run newspaper, they printed a commentary that included a rarely used phrase that essentially translates into, don't say I didn't warn you. It sounds like a schoolyard taunt, but that specific wording was used twice before in editorials by the paper, once in 1962 before China went to war with India and before China invaded Vietnam in 1979. China has also cracked down on Hong Kong. The UK colonized Hong Kong, but they reached an agreement with China to turn it back over in 97 with the stipulation it would operate under a basic agreement that preserved certain freedoms in Hong Kong. It was called a one country, two systems arrangement. But as China became more authoritarian and then started installing its norms into Hong Kong, protests grew in Hong Kong, especially beginning in 2014 during what were called the umbrella movement. The protesters used umbrellas to protect themselves from tear gas. I happened to be there for work in that time and I took this photo and I, I talked to some of the young protesters I asked one of them if they were scared, and she told me she was confident they would win. But you know, at the time they were so young, and, and I, was, I was amazed at their courage, and, but I was also worried for them. And rightly so, as it turned out, because all the protest leaders of Hong Kong are either now in jail or in exile. And that's because late last year, there were more protests and Hong Kong cracked down on them violently. And then China passed a national security law which prohibits free speech and assembly in Hong Kong and even by people like you and me talking about freedom in Hong Kong here and elsewhere around the world, we might be breaking this law in the Zoom session. So even as China became more oppressive, its economy continued to grow. This is a photo of the Pudong area of Shanghai. Back in the early 1990s, it was essentially farmland, but today it looks like a modern Manhattan or Tokyo. Since China opened up in 1979, and especially since the 1990s, China has been one of the great economic success stories in human history. That's partly because China is big. They're achieving things at a scale not seen previously. Here you see a representation of China's population. As you can see, China and India are about the same size. Although in the next few years, India will become more populous than China. In fact, they may already be. There's some evidence that China has been miscounting their population and China miscounts a lot of things, uh, including some stuff with economic data. But China is big, the second largest economy in the world behind only the United States. And this gives a great geopolitical leverage. Companies and people want to sell and invest in such a large market. It's a big lure in their market and gives them great leverage. But in per capita terms, 
China is far behind US, European countries, Japan, and a lot of other places. And its GDP per capita is also much lower than other Asian tigers, such as Korea and Taiwan, at similar time periods of development. China's GDP per capita increased from a low level 30 years ago, but it's really it's far behind where one might expect to be after decades of economic high growth. And a myth about China is they're only a copycat economy, that they merely steal intellectual property. In fact, they do steal intellectual property, but they're also a great innovator. Two, two things can be true at the same time. China is well ahead of the United States and other countries in mobile payments, for example, and have been for some time. You can buy just about anything on your phone without entering credit card numbers or using cash in a store. It's, you, know, you can even provide funds to homeless people using your phone. And China is also working on artificial intelligence using large amounts of data they collect to do so. Large data sets help drive machine learning for AI. And China is making great strides in biotechnology. A few years ago, I met with the CEO of a biotech company called BGI in Shenzhen. Shenzhen's in the south of China, right near Hong Kong. And BGI is the largest repository of sequenced genomes in the world. China's also great innovators in surveillance technology, including creating and using gait recognition technology. That is, recognizing someone by the way they walk. It gives a whole new meaning to the Aerosmith Run DMC song. All this economic success means that China is the great poverty alleviator in the history of the world. They brought more than 700 million people out of extreme poverty over the last 40 years. And in fact, more people have risen out of poverty during that time period around the world than at any other time in history. And China is a big part of that uh, reason why that happened. China's also changing other parts of the world. Some people complain about China providing unsustainable loans to Africa and other developing countries, and then using the loans as leverage to extract things from these countries. And that's true and it does happen. But separately, there's thousands of individual Chinese business people in Africa making investments and setting up factories. As China has become more expensive due to its economic success, these Chinese business people, not the government, set up factories in Rwanda, Kenya, Nigeria, and, and other places in Africa where they're making clothing, shoes, and other items. This is providing a chance for these countries to develop their manufacturing capabilities and grow and develop as places like Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and China did. And this phenomenon is already changing Southeast Asia for the better. Bangladesh is a good chance you might have some clothing that was made in Bangladesh. In fact, I'm pretty sure the shirt I'm wearing was made in Bangladesh. It now has a higher GDP per capita than India or Pakistan. And just before the pandemic in kind of late 2019, I toured a shoe factory in Vietnam. The shoe factory had relocated to Vietnam from China five years before that. So remember, this is before the US-China trade wars. It moved because as labor became more expensive in China, as other things became more expensive in China, manufacturing assembly was moving. That's bringing new capabilities and new expertise to these countries. So China's success is important it's been beneficial for the world in many ways. But China now faces economic headwinds. They have aging demographics, for one. There's too many Chinese that look like me and not enough that look like our children. Under current trends, China's population in the next 20 years will be older than the United States. It's one of the reasons why China's economy is slowed and won't grow at the same rate it has previously. Remember that increases in GDP come from two things. One, an increase in productivity, and two, an increase in the working age population. Well, China's working age population has been declining for five years. And trends for birth rates have gotten worse in the last few years, not better. So China's demographic situation is actually worsening beyond what was already projected. Uh, recently, the Financial Times reported that China's census population showed a decrease in the overall population. That's the overall population, not the working age population. China quickly denied this, but they didn't dispute that the fertility rate mentioned in the article of 1.5 was true. And again, 1.5 is below current projections. And in fact, in the last few weeks, people have been saying it's actually down to 1.3. So the projections that I show in this chart and you've seen elsewhere 
they're actually understating what's happening in China. China is going to get older and smaller sooner than we thought. So GDP growth won't come from an increase in their working age population. But what about productivity? Their productivity lags far behind advanced countries. It's true their annual productivity increases are larger than developed countries, but each year these increases have been decreasing. And currently each Chinese worker produces far less than South Koreans, Japanese, Americans, Mexicans, and many other workers. There are other challenges to China's economy, including as we've seen in the news in recent weeks and months, trying to reduce an over-reliance on real estate in its economy. Some people have been calling Evergrande, the uh, company, the real estate company you've been reading about in the news, they've been calling it China's Lehman moment, thinking that what happened in the United States and then the rest of the world during the financial crisis is gonna happen to China. Given the state controlled nature of the financial sector in China, I think that scenario is probably unlikely, but not impossible. More possible is that Evergrande and other problematic real estate companies are harboring her to something more akin to what happened in Japan in 1989 that then led to long-term economic malaise. As you can see in this chart, China's economy is stunningly over-reliant on real estate, so painful adjustments are in the cards sooner or later. Around 70% of the wealth of urban Chinese households is in real estate, and even the rest of their financial assets are tied up indirectly with real estate. So if real estate values fall, and they have been falling in recent months, and if the value of real estate related companies fall, China's middle class is going to feel it, and they're not going to be happy. And so the question is, even as China's government knows it needs to reduce its reliance on real estate for its economy, will they be able to handle the pain of the adjustment? Evergrande's public troubles in recent weeks are maybe a perverse sign of good for China that China is gonna try and deal with the, with the problem of, of over-reliance on real estate. But there's been already some indications that China may not let the pain of the real estate adjustment continue. Regardless of the current real estate concerns and debt issues, which I won't go into here just because of time, but regardless of these things uh, and whether they lead to economic malaise uh, like Japan in the 1990s, China is not gonna have high GDP growth rates that it sustained for nearly four decades going forward. Because of catch up from the COVID pandemic, they might achieve some good returns in the very short term. But after that, China's GDP growth rates are gonna be much more similar to America's and Europe's than to China's past three decades. So China's more authoritarian and they're more expansionist and they've achieved great economic success, giving them much leverage in the world economy and in geopolitics, but they're facing great economic challenges going forward and will no longer have a fast growing economy. What to do about that in that con about China in that context? So we are in what I call a competition of competence. China is offering a model for the world, and so are liberalized countries, including America. The question is, which model will be viewed as successful, and which one will countries want to follow? This is one of the reasons why I call Vietnam one of the five most important countries in the world. Vietnam's economy has been developing quickly over the last decade, but it faces a crossroads now as it does so. If Vietnam's economy continues to grow, and if it builds the necessary infrastructure and continues to reform economically, the big question is, will it reform politically? Will Vietnam take the path created by South Korea and Taiwan, which developed economically and then, developed, uh, and then reformed and liberalized politically? Or has China forged a new trail down which all non-democracies will now tread? Vietnam's Communist Party could liberalize economically, but use China's tactics to ensure continued, continued control politically. Now, in my book, I recommend a number of policies to deal with China, but I, also assert, but I also assert the most important thing we can do to deal with a more repressive, expansionist China is to improve our own country, to offer a better model to win the competition of competence. Identify four big policy issues we need to address. I also admit I'm not omniscient and don't have all the answers. Uh, I won't go into all the details about my ideas here, but we'll say that one of them has to do with American infrastructure. As you know, there's an infrastructure bill working its way through Congress. The debate on that bill has focused on how much we should spend. 
But there's been no discussion on why it costs two to three times more to build, build infrastructure in America than it does in Europe or Japan with no commensurate benefits to the environment or labor. Again, we're in a competition of competence. I also recommend moving human rights more to the forefront of our foreign policy with China. Human rights is of course a moral issue, but it's also the most treacherous landscape for China to diverse. They're committing what a lot of people call genocide in Xinjiang, or if it's not technically genocide, it's a crime against humanity. And China also fears their own citizens, which is why they must censor the internet and most other aspects of society. That, remember, is a sign of weakness, not strength. Now, whenever human rights are raised, China will say two things. One, they'll say it's an internal matter. And two, they'll say, who is America with its racial inequality problems to lecture China or anyone else about human rights abuses? On the former, I write in my book, quote, determining the rate of a capital gains tax is an internal affair. Debating the best route for a new high-speed rail line is an internal matter. The torture of Zumret de Wout, a Uyghur, is a matter of the whole world. And on the latter, Biden and other public officials can preface every Chinese human rights statement with, yeah, we have a lot of issues to deal with, we need to be better, but that does not excuse imprisoning over 1 million Uyghurs and forcibly sterilizing them. <clears throat> so the US has issues with China, but guess what? So do a bunch of other countries. On the economy, China's market is not just closed to American companies in many sectors, but to all countries. And China's aggressive expansionist policies are affecting other countries even more than the United States. Think about Vietnam or Indonesia or the Philippines and the South China Sea, for example. Or note that when Sweden's journalist organization decided to give an award to a Swedish citizen, Hui Min Hai, who's been arrested and is in jail in China for writing stories about China, China's ambassadors threatened Sweden. China's line about internal affairs only applies to them. They in interfere in other people's internal affairs all the time. The US under Trump made creating alliances against China more difficult by applying tariffs on just about uh, all of our allies in Europe, Canada, Japan, and elsewhere. And the new Biden administration has said it will make rebuilding alliances a priority, but it's not gonna be easy. For one thing, it's a different world than it was four years ago. The rest of the world moved on from America, creating their own alliances, whether the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership Trade Agreement that went on without America, or new supply chain alliances that have been created by Japan and India and Australia, or in many other ways. And so far, Biden is not removing tariffs and has annoyed allies such as France during the recent um, submarine deal with Australia. In the US, although now doing more on the vaccine front, has not been a particularly strong leader in vaccinating the world. The US in trying to build alliances needs to frame it as how we can be helpful to countries rather than let's just build an alliance against China. Other countries want China's market less closed, so frame it that way rather than let's contain China. Or with Vietnam, help them fully vaccinate their population. We have thus far not been very smart or effective in dealing with China. As you can see from these two quotes, China believes America is in decline, and they're not the only ones. Many countries feel that way. The attempted insurrection of January 6 only reinforced this belief for a lot of people around the world. But once America was seen as a beacon of democracy, a place where anyone could find success, instead we have people in fur hats invading our Capitol building, a less than robust, a less than robust response to COVID-19, and more important in that regard, not taking leadership to help squash it around the world. The world adjusted America's retreat from world leadership. And China, of course, has become more aggressive, assertive. And as I noted, there's new alliances being formed around the world to deal with China's new assertiveness uh, in Europe and in Asia and other places. Everybody's adjusting, even with Trump gone and Biden now president. It's a new world, and in some ways it's a tougher world, but there's much hope in our future as well, including with China. The last two years have been tough with COVID-19 and other problems. There's, there's no doubt about it. I can't sugarcoat the last couple of years. But it's important to look at the big picture. The last 70 years have been ones of remarkable progress. We talked earlier about the remarkable reduction of poverty around the world, but poverty has fallen in the United States during that time as well, although it's almost never remarked upon. And poverty fell for all races and all ethnicities. 
and more people around the world have education than ever before. Literacy is at all-time highs. Child mortality rates are down. Vaccinations are up. And speaking of vaccinations, COVID-19 is bad and destructive as it's been on health, social, and economic factors. It's driving amazing innovation. We developed a vaccine in record time, and this vaccine development isn't just great because of COVID-19. The new mRNA technology, it has applications for treating cancer, other viruses such as HIV, and even the common cold. So the pandemic is driving all sorts of medical progress. I think it's going to drive different changes in the supply chain and in lots of other areas. But the last few years have seen setbacks from around the world. But if we stop and we examine what helped us to be successful the last 70 years and what steps we need to take to continue and to evolve and improve upon that success, there's no reason why the next 70 years can't also bring amazing amounts of progress, including China liberalizing and being a helpful contributor to the world. Thanks uh, very much. Uh, you can only cover so much in China in 25 minutes, so I'm happy to answer any questions or hear comments or, or whatever else. I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay, thank you so much, Sam. Um, I think I'm gonna take my uh, executive privilege here and uh, ask a question. I, I always love to um, sort of uh, be provocative in this way, but um, you know, what you outlined kind of begs a question. Why, why would China liberalize? I mean, everything's going great from their point of view. Um, what's, what's not, not to like, obviously I'm exaggerating, but there, there needs to be a case beyond, uh, just, you know, it's good. Now, it's a great question. It, it's, it's, you know, I got to, we're in a competition of competence, uh, and that, uh, some other countries have been looking at China as a model, right? Because things have gone well there the last four years in terms of the economy. I think there's a couple of reasons why uh, the, hopefully there'll be liberalization at some point in the future in China. Probably not next month, maybe not next year, but at some point in the future. But one is there've been plenty of academic studies that have shown that uh, liberalized democracies, economies grow faster than authoritarian government countries, economies do. Now, they don't grow at a much higher rate. It's actually a relatively small difference. But if you can have good economic growth and have freedom, why would you not choose uh, both? The, the other thing is, as I, as I tried to show, is China is facing a lot of economic challenges now. Their, their period of high economic growth is, is over. Um, some people think, oh, China's going to keep growing at 6, 7, 8, 9, 10% over the coming decades. And that's just, in my opinion, and looking at the data, that's just not going to be the case for the reasons I tried to talk about. So they're going to have slower economic growth. They're going to have a lot of economic challenges in the coming uh, years and decades. Uh, and uh, China is becoming more oppressive. So it's not like it was, say, 10 years ago when things seem to be going a little differently than they are under the Xi Jinping era. Uh, and I'm curious how that will affect what they're trying to do going forward. So when you have a campaign against so-called sissy men or even more crackdowns on, on other things, uh, it'll be interesting to see if the, if the Chinese community eventually will get tired of that. As well as, you know, the, China has also done a big crackdown on, on a, a, what was a nascent feminist movement in China but in recent years under Xi Jinping, that's been completely cracked on as well. So as much of the rest of the world is going in one direction, trying to provide more freedom and, and make up for lost time and the way different communities of people have been treated, China's been going the opposite way. So I think as their economy runs into more difficulties, as the oppression grows stronger, uh, the, the, the Chinese people at some point will start to see more stark differences in their country and other countries. But it, like I say, we're in a competition of competence. So you know, I don't, I personally don't think America is doing very well right now either, as well as a number of other liberalized countries. That's why it's important for liberalized countries to really get their act together. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, Heather, let's go to Heather O'Brien. Hi there. Hi. Um, thanks, Mr. Kaplan, for an excellent, excellent and broad ranging uh, discussion. It was really excellent. Um, two related questions, please. Um, having worked with the ITU uh, while I was with the United Nations, really important, you know, 
large, sometimes messy organization, but great for setting long-term standards. Could you share with us a little more about what's happening with AI in, um, in the ITU and how China is lobbying to set those standards and how we can ensure their you know, human rights respecting in such an important UN body and also related to probably AI and surveillance in China. Could you tell us any other human rights hotspots in China that we should be you know, a cognizant of um, besides the terrible things happening to the Uyghurs? You know, what else is on the radar that, that we should also be aware of? Thank you. Yeah, great, great questions. Um, so on the telecommunications and the ITU, and, and it's great to actually see someone else who actually knows the ITU exists. Um, the, uh, I'd love to talk to you offline sometime about your, your work there. Uh, so you may more know more of the technical aspects of it than I, but so China, one thing they've been doing both at the ITU and other parts of the UN and other parts of multilateral organizations is over the years, they've been getting key folks from China in key positions in these organizations, and they've done that at the ITU. And so they're, they're trying to make it, uh, so the, tele, the standards on things like facial recognition technology will allow it to be used to monitor ci citizens uh, of their own, own country. And like I say, they, China's also been exporting this kind of technology to other countries. So where you might have some restrictions on what a government could do in using facial recognition technology, China's actually making it easier with the standards so it's easier for governments to use that facial recognition technology to spy on their own citizens and track their own citizens. They often do it under the guise of dealing with crime or terrorism or other things like that. And they, when they talk about helping other countries use it, it's the same thing as like, oh, we're just gonna make you safer uh, citizens of this country because we can track folks. But really it's, it's designed to make the, the, provide the government of these authoritarian places uh, to have more power and, and to keep themselves in power. Um, in terms of where there's other human rights abuses, I mean, there's all sorts of places. I think I'll mention one that um, came up in a conversation I had with someone yesterday who worked in Mongolia uh, for many years, in inner Mongolia. Um, and uh, China is working to basically erase the culture of inner Mongolia like they have in Tibet and, and, and in more recent years in, in Xinjiang with the Uyghurs. Um, they're making it illegal to use the Mongolian language and doing all sorts of other things to basically honify uh, inner Mongolia. So there's been a lot of efforts to do ethnic cleansing in China in recent years, and it seems to be getting more um, robust and worse in recent years. So that, that's one way I think that, that things have been happening. Great, okay, thank you so much, Sam. Um, okay, we'll go now to Wing Kai, who we're going to see after this session in our informal post-chat chat. Hi, Wing Kai, go right ahead. Hi, thank you, Mary. Uh, thank you, Sam, for this really uh, wonderful summary of your book. Um, I'm amazed by all your knowledge about what's happening right now, and you keep up to date to some of the current developments, uh, both in China and in the US. Um, one thing that you haven't really touched on in your summary is um, the role of education and um, research and development. And as you know, over the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a lot of knowledge exchange, especially through education and culture between the two countries even though there were disagreements between the governments and with there, there are a lot of differences between the two governments. Um, the peoples of both countries have tried to reach, learn from each other and cooperate, including the you know, academic community, the business community and the civil society. Um, as you know, the Trump administration had the so-called China Initiative and that affected a lot of exchange uh, especially over the last few years. There are, there are Chinese scientists who were accused of being you know, spies, which were not entirely true in some cases. And so there, there are issues that are affecting, you know, for us as academics who really try to really open doors for both sides. And um, I think the key is of course to compete, but also to understand and to bridge the differences and try to find solutions. So I wonder whether you have any thoughts on that. Great, thanks. 
It's a great question, a great point. And, and um, the Center of Excellence I run is actually located at a college. We work all over Washington State, but uh, we're located at a particular college. And they had a, a good uh, um, couple of different partnerships in China, and I've, I've helped them with that. Those during the pandemic have you know, gone very quiet and maybe going quiet for other reasons as well. And you have two pieces to this. You have the China side and the US side, and I think both have been failing uh, at this uh, in some of the ways you talked about. Let's start maybe with the US side. So yeah, there, there was a case that was uh, thrown out of court recently where uh, a Chinese uh, um, person was accused of, of, I think of spying and that was thrown out. And really, if you look at the charges, it's just ridiculous it ever been brought to, to begin with. And, and it was, seemed to me to be a blatant example of overreach and discrimination uh, by the American side. It started on the Trump side and then it's now been uh, resolved, fortunately. Uh, and I think that and before the pandemic, it was something like what, 350,000 Chinese studying at our colleges each year. And to me, that is a good thing. And there's no doubt that I'm sure among those 350,000 were a few people who were spying or doing other things, but not to use a cliche, you don't throw out the baby with that with the bathwater. That the 350,000 Chinese coming here to study is good for America and for China in all sorts of different ways. One, if it helps for our students here in America to have interactions with people from other parts of the world, whether it's China or students from other parts of the world, so they are becoming uh, more acquainted and develop their international cultural uh, skills and seeing what else is happening around the world because they're gonna be going into a globalized workforce. It already is a globalized workforce. So they're gonna, they're gonna need that for their careers, but it's also gonna be good for them as, as human beings. And two, these Chinese are seeing things. Some things maybe we are bad about America, some things are good about America, but they're getting to experience things as well, getting outside of their country. And that's true for any other uh, country students that come to, to study here. Uh, I might mention that uh, Vietnam, uh, I think is very good for Vietnamese students to come here. I'll also mention that we've increasingly made it difficult for students to come study in America. During the Trump administration, even though Vietnam is theoretically can be an ally in, in what we're trying to deal with with China, 50%, half of the visas of Vietnamese applying to study in the United States were rejected. So it's very difficult for Vietnamese to come here and study. And we've seen that with other countries and also with China. So it's good for America that these folks are coming to study here. I would provide more of them uh, visas to stay after they study and work here and, and add to our, our talent pool, especially right now we're at a time of, of labor shortages. And there's been study after study that shows that immigrants do not decrease the wages of Americans and do not take jobs from the Americans. It actually does the exact opposite, increases the number of jobs, and it keeps wages going up. So uh, I'm a very strong proponent of immigration. From, from the Chinese side, uh, they're making it uh, more difficult for Chinese students to study overseas in, in the last year. Again, there's it's been a decade of things that have been happening just in the last few months. So it, it, I appreciate the compliment about my trying to keep up with it all, but it, it's virtually impossible to keep up with everything that's happening. Um, so th they've had that happen. They've also, of course, uh, more famously uh, in the last a uh, couple of months have made illegal tutoring and made tutoring companies illegal, uh, trying to uh, make it uh, so that there's been a lot of debate about why they did this, but essentially got rid of an entire industry by doing that in a stroke of a pen overnight. It could be they are really worried about too many people uh, getting stressed out and studying. You have that in other countries as well, like South Korea and other places that that's been a problem. Some people have speculated this is part of their effort to reverse that low fertility rate trend that I talked about and try and get uh, students having more time and wanting to, to start families and so forth. So I'm not sure why they're doing this, but they, they've done a lot of that. They've also made it more difficult um, to do partnerships. I'm going to get which country, it was it Yale that just pulled out of China, uh, some programs they had there. It might have been a different college. I might, Harvard, I Harvard did. Harvard, thank, thank you, Mary. We have many people who want to comment on this too. So, yeah. So, please, if other people want to ask about this or comment, please, please go ahead. I'll stop there. Okay, great. Thank you so much. It's it's a it's a rich topic um, and one that uh, certainly concerns anyone working in citizen diplomacy. All right. So now we're going to go to Ed 
and then we'll go to Catherine and we'll try to uh, squeeze in um, as many questions as, as humanly possible. All right, so let's go to Ed. Uh, again, Professor, thank you very much for your, for your talk today. I'd like to talk a little bit about Taiwan and the situation there. Um, if, if, as you say, and it looks like there's a distinct possibility of being some economic problems in, um, in China, a perfect thing for a dictator to do or an authoritarian, whatever you want to call Xi Jinping, to distract his populace is let's go to war with someone. What do you think is, I mean, well, what does the PLA think about this? I mean, the, the logistics behind it, uh, uh, to, to attack across the ocean, D-Day, I mean, that was an incredible thing to do and how difficult it was and China's never done it before. Saber rattling is one thing, sending the jets. How real do you think is a possibility? Okay, thanks, Ed. It's a great question. And if I was uh, knew the exact answer, I'd be the head of the chief of staff, uh, for the joint chiefs of staff. But it, it's, um, I am worried about that at some point China will invade Taiwan. And, and Xi Jinping has a number of times talked about he does not want to put it off forever. Uh, so he's what, 69 years old. At this point, it looks like he's going to rule for a long time, but you know, he's, he is getting older. So at some point, he may want to take care of this. I'm actually, don't think it'll probably happen in the next year or two because of uh, the semiconductor issue. And there's a great um, there's a great article written by someone. I can send it to you all later, Mary, if you want to send it out to folks. Uh, written by a guy who knows semiconductors very well. And so you know, TSMC, the big semiconductor company in Taiwan, supplies a huge percentage of the high end semiconductors of the world. Supply chain problems, you know, one of the reasons you haven't been able to get your, your new car or your new iPhone is there's been a problem with the uh, supply chain in, in uh, semiconductors. But if China invaded Taiwan, uh, the United States and its allies appear to have plans for that, that uh, fact, the factories for TSMC in Taiwan probably would not survive as well as a lot of talent would leave. Uh, so undoubtedly what would happen is you would disrupt the world economy if, if China invaded Taiwan now when so much of the world relies on those semiconductors from TSMC. I don't think China will invade until they build up their own semiconductor industry at the high end level of semiconductors. Uh, I'm not 100% confident in that because people do crazy things all the time in our world. And like you say, there may become a time where they want to distract their population. But uh, it gives me some confidence there will not be an invasion of Taiwan in the next year, two years, or until China builds up their high-end semiconductor capability. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, so um, I'm actually uh, we're going to go to Catherine. Um, if um, thank you very much, Mr. Kaplan. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you online. And the prior speaker, Mr. Martins, um, had the exact same question that I wanted to ask him. But let me push you a little further on that. Um, on the one hand, having been to Taiwan three or four times, it had, and recognizing the history, which I know you well know, the strategic ambiguity of whether the United States will or will not respond and where what Japan will do or not do has some argue, and I'm not arguing it, some argue served us well. And now we are raising at a point where there's so much tension. We, the United States on both sides of the aisle are pushing back on China very hard. Um, I want you to, I, I'd really like to hear what you think. Uh, and I know you kicked it. Well, you didn't quite kick it, but you said others may know better than I, but intuitively, um, this is a really big issue for us, um, for us, because we did not do well with the Spratly Islands, as you well know. Um, we have avoided, um, and let me be quiet to say, I want to hear your opinion on that. And, and just one more thing that I was delighted to hear you say, I totally agree with you. We have to be far more clear eyed in our readiness to compete. And I think we have to be clear eyed within our academic relationships because it's not that we don't want to welcome others, but we have been quite naive at recognizing where our 
intellectual property has been stolen. So back to Taiwan, what are your thoughts? Sure, well, so let me ask you, you say we've been really hard on China. In what ways do you think we've been really hard on China? That um, because I feel like we have not been that hard in China, even, even under the Trump administration. We certainly put tariffs on, uh, but that hurt our companies as much as it hurt the Chinese companies. So it, it, there was a recent report that came out recently that it appears to have hurt both China and the United States economically. In terms of Taiwan, uh, I get that there's been uh, some strategic ambiguity, I think is how you put it. And maybe that's been helpful in trying to not impel China to go to invade Taiwan. But I feel that uh, at this point, that is, you know, China, that what probably was more accurate when China felt less confident in its abilities. And I don't think, uh, I think things have changed over the last 10 years. And in fact, in my book, I talk about it's changed really since the financial crisis. When the financial crisis hit in 2008 and nine, uh, China started to think, you know what, America is not all it's cracked up to be. Our system is working as well or better than theirs. In fact, they, they, they survived the financial crisis better than, than America and Europe did. And so they, they, they became more aggressive. And there's a new book came out that, uh, recently, Rush Dashi's The Long Game, which talks about that. I say in my book, he documents it in 330 pages or so. So uh, I think I think we need to give China agency. They're, they're going to make their decisions to invade Taiwan, not because of what we say, uh, but because of their own calculus uh, for doing so. I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead. You're, you're muted. Well, I, I, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time for discussion in this section, although we will have the No, question. I know. I, I did not say we have been, we have, we have not been tough enough. Please, no one consider. We have not been tough enough. Okay. And we have not been clear-eyed. Thank you. Sorry to mishear you. Great. Okay. Uh, so we're going to try and squeeze in a lightning round uh, question and answer with uh, Mary Mendoza. Mary, go right ahead. Okay. Uh, what happens when Xi dies? I mean, nobody lives forever, not even Xi Jinping. Plus, there's also the question of nukes and the sex ratio imbalance. How does that all act? Throw that all into the mix, the hopper, because those haven't been mentioned. I mean, I keep thinking nukes and it's like, ah, oh, crap. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and you're right. She's not going to live forever unless you believe the Silicon Valley uh, longevity type people, which I don't think is going to happen anytime soon. Uh, uh, and, and actually, I'll answer your question by asking a question I asked some China experts recently, who none of them really gave me a good answer. We, we've been all asking, why is China doing the things it's been doing the last couple of months, the, the cracking down on celebrity culture, the cracking down on consumer internet, and, and all the other things? Nobody's really answered to my satisfaction is, how are they making those decisions? So did she wake up one day and decide, I hate sissy men, quote sissy men? Did I, we need to do something about this, we need to do something about that, all these different things. We don't have a good idea of how these decisions are made. There, there are certainly departments that come up with recommendations or he has different commissions doing thing, things, but how often is he meeting with them and does he, does he veto them? on his own, or is there a small group with him be doing these things or agreeing to these things? Uh, there is a extreme lack of understanding of how decisions are made in China under Xi Jinping. I talked about at the very beginning of my presentation that when he came to Seattle, no decisions were made until his inner circle um, came to Seattle about a week before the trip. That was different before that. People lower down the, the pipeline had decision-making ability. It appears to be much more constrained, but we don't understand how that's being done and who's doing it. And so when she dies, we don't know what's going to happen either, or if he gets pushed out at some point. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And, and I'll say that I'll answer by saying nobody knows the answer right now. There needs to be more study on it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think that that has just about used up our time. As you can see, lots of questions. Sam, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. And thank you for being with us tonight.